Hi everyone, Sheila Butler with Successful Women Talk. I want to say thanks so much for joining me on today's episode and I am super excited to bring our guest today, Sarah Robinson. She is an author, speaker, consultant. She wrote the book Fierce Loyalty, Unlocking the DNA to Wildly Successful Communities. It is a great read. I have it on my, I have a Kindle version of it. It's a quick read but really full of a lot of valuable information. So welcome Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with us today. Sure. I, Happy to be here. I love the conversation around community, right? Especially yeah. with all of this social media stuff going on. So I really appreciate you taking the time. Sure. Hey, let me, can we, let's first start with a little bit of history about you, your background, and maybe okay. how that helped you get to where you are today. Uh, okay. How far <laughs> back do you want me to go? Well, you can do the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> Um, well, uh, my first job out of college was at St. Louis University, and I was asked to build a community in a dorm where uh, no community whatsoever existed. So I had to figure out how to do that. How do you make a community from, you know, less than zero? And as I moved through my career, I built communities, whatever I was doing, I built a community because... I'm lazy and it's just easier <laughs> if you have a community to help. <laughs> that is a terrific point. I'm just lazy. And um, so whatever I was doing, uh, whether I was working for myself or working for somebody else or raising money or whatever it was I was doing, I always built a community around that um, to multiply my efforts. And about, let's see. About two, almost two years ago, um, I was um, emceeing an event for two of my dear, dear friends, Elizabeth Marshall and Janet Goldstein. They run a book breakthrough event for burgeoning, burgeoning, burgeoning authors, and um, we were having a conversation. They've been after me to write a book forever, and I was like, I write about. I mean, you know, everything I know, everybody else already knows. So they made me go through my resume, like everything I'd ever done, ever. And about three quarters of the way through, Janet Goldstein looked at me and said, oh, you've been building communities. I'm like, well, yeah, but everybody knows how to do that. And she's like, um, no, they don't. <laughs> They don't. So you so, just sort of took that for granted. That was just a skill set. Well, yeah. You, yeah. I think, here's what I think. I believe that the thing that comes easiest to us, we assume everyone else already knows how to do, and it's not true. It is the thing we most, are most likely um, need to teach. And do you think it's also one of those things that you think maybe isn't that valuable? Like for instance, I'm a systems nut. I love to go in oh, to companies. Bless you. I'm so not. You come <laughs> to my house and set up some systems all day long. <laughs> well, it's just funny. I'm like not. I think that I just find that as second nature and that's now where that's sort of the, the, the route I'm on now because so many people don't. I mean, to me, it's like, fun and to most people it's like oh, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's sort of do you see it sort of sees the same thing so you you were just naturally great at building communities yes and thought everybody else knew how to do that too and that it was you know see this you know this is just what you do you you know <laughs> so they gave me a research project they're like okay so here's what you're going to do sarah you um break down all the communities you've ever built Pick out the communities, the brand communities that you think really have it going on and pick communities across all spectrums and see if you can pull these communities apart and find some commonality, some common something um, that they all have. I'm a research geek. That's what I love to do. In college, getting a research paper assignment was the greatest thing ever. I was a geek like that. So I was like, cool, awesome. So I went off and did my research, not knowing at all what I would find. And so I pulled all these communities apart. I listed all the common qualities. I was cross-referencing lists. I was, you know, just mired in, you know, what do these communities share? And I came up I managed to break it all down to a list of about 
gosh, I think when I started, it was about 14 qualities is what I got it down to. Then I worked with my very good friend, Les McEwen, who um, thinks in Venn diagrams. <laughs> That's how he thinks. He thinks in Venn diagrams. God love him. Um, and I sat down with him and we looked at the list of qualities and we started just hashing out, you know, is there a model here? Is there a model that um, all of these communities share and that these qualities point to? And through my work with him and then through subsequently going out and testing that model, that's how the Fierce Loyalty model was born. I love that. So, yeah, I, I really love that you took something that just came natural to you. <clears throat> and then I love that your friends challenged you. That's terrific. Well, I don't let just anybody challenge me. These are friends that I actually really like. <laughs> These are real friends, yeah. <laughs> real friends. And yeah, when they say you got to go do this, I mean, I can't talk to them again until I do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask you, what are those characteristics? So you've sort of narrowed it, so you had 14, but you've sort of kind of narrowed that down even from there, right? Yep. And can yep. we talk about what those are? Because they seem to be, like you said, common within any community. And can that be a large community? And even like I'm trying to build a small community myself, can it be applied to the same thing? Every place I've tested it, it holds true. Everything from a neighborhood watch. Um, some people have told me they actually use it for their family. They're building, you know, they're using, they want their family to be a community all the way through Fortune 500 companies, oh, non terrific. for profits, government agencies. I mean, it, it holds, and that's what it had to be. For me, if I was going to actually, you know, plant my flag in something, it had to hold um, across everything. Otherwise, it wasn't really a valid model. I can't stand models. They're like, well, this works here, but it's not really a model for over there. I'm like, well, then it's not a model, is it? <laughs> it's a solution for that problem. It, it's a solution for that industry's problem. It's not a model. Um, and so, yeah. So I can sort of walk you through sure. um, what I came up with. And the very first element, I wish I could draw. <laughs> <laughs> The very first element to um, a community, a fiercely loyal community, is that it has what I call a frame, a frame of common interest. And sometimes that common interest is the brand itself. Very often it is not. Um, you can't hear me talk about fierce loyalty for 30 seconds without me talking about Harley Davidson. They are my <laughs> poster child. People are like, oh, but how could you help Harley? I'm like, I can't help Harley. <laughs> I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they invented fiercely loyal. They community. get it. I know. I mean, uh, uh, and you don't even have to understand them, <laughs> yeah, or the writers to know that they've got a fiercely loyal community. Um, but if you think about what their frame is, uh, most people assume, oh, it's the motorcycle. I'm like, it's not. What it is is a common value. The common value of all Harley riders is personal freedom. And they talk about that on their website a ton, a ton. The motorcycle is simply a representation of that value. So anyway, but sometimes it is the product, um, like Apple. Uh, although even I would debate whether it's actually the thing. I think it's actually, the, it, again, it's more than Apple. The people who are Apple fanatics, it's about that personal creative expression. Yep. And a slight um, interest in being different. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I heard this. The, when the iPhone 5 came out, someone posted something that said, do you know how you will know when someone has a new iPhone 5? And the answer was, they're going to tell you because they're, that is correct. they're going to tell you. <laughs> and show it to you and tell you why you should have one and can't. <laughs> That's a fiercely loyal community member. Anyway, so the first element is this common frame. And I always tell people, you know, take your best guess at what this frame is. Ask some people who are already in your community if you happen to have that luxury. If you don't, take your best guess and move on. I have started many, many communities thinking I knew what the frame was only to get into the building process and find out that it's something else altogether. And that's okay. It's not the end of the world. It's more important to pick something and move forward because then your forward work will inform you. So you've got the common frame. Then the next thing 
is you cast a really wide net. You are looking for anybody and everybody who is having a conversation about this common interest. Okay. So uh, internet makes that super easy because you can search social media conversations. You can do Google alerts. You can look in the newspaper for meetings uh, that have, have topics around, you know, the common interests that you've chosen. Your job at this moment is to find as many people as you can and observe as many conversations as you can. This is not the time to jump into the conversation and hijack it for your brand. Participate if it makes sense and if you can be helpful. You, you are observing because now that you've cast this really wide net, you're looking for the ideal candidates for your community. Just because someone shares the common interest doesn't necessarily make them fabulous candidates. Good point. The candidates for your community have three common interests that they will either overtly or not so overtly express. <laughs> They, and this is the next piece of the frame, they have the need for belonging. They want to belong to something bigger than themselves. They have the need for recognition, and I don't mean prizes. I mean the kind of recognition where you're seen and heard. And they have the need for safety. They want to be in a group of like-minded people and feel safe expressing um, whatever it is they need to express. So you're listening for those three qualities and that that when those expressions come up you know you found great candidates for your community now here's what happens the people who have these needs will either miraculously find each other and form their own community like occupy wall street did or they will go out and find a community that already exists because to get those three needs met they have to find a community that's the only way those needs can be met how that you need to ask me something? Oh, I was just going to say, and are we kind of structured or predisposed to want to be in tribes and communities? Isn't that kind of our making? I think so. I mean, there are some people who it is not, they are loners. You know, they were the roaming loner, you know, caveman. They did not belong to a, a tribe. They didn't care if the saber-toothed tiger was going to eat them. But yeah, I think way back our reptilian brain is, is programmed for um, tribes because that's how you eat. That's how you stay safe. That's how you, I mean, you're, the survival of the species is based, you know, is, is predicated on that. Right. So yes, we, most of us are pretty programmed for that. Not everybody. Um, so we have these needs and um, people are looking for a community to get those needs met. How they find their community isn't nearly as important as the structure of that community, which is the next piece in the model. And there are three non-negotiables. I mean, a community can have a lot of qualities, but there are three absolute non-negotiables, and those are connection points. Um, these people want to be connected with you and your brand, but they also want to be connected with each other. And that's a piece, as I do more work in the fierce loyalty space, I'm finding that's one of the... Um, differentiators is people like, yeah, yeah, really great connections important. I'm like, yeah, but not just with you. Right. You've got to connect these people to each other. So they have to be talking as well. The yes. Uh, support mechanisms. Yes, they absolutely want support from you and your brand, but they also want to give and get support from each other. One of the most interesting things I did when I was writing this book was dig into the happiness research. Mm-hmm. Because I wanted to see if there was a connection between happiness and loyalty. I had no idea if there would be, and there is. Interestingly enough, the things that influence our happiness, our feelings of happiness, more than money, more than the pursuit of pleasure, are meaningful connection and engagement. And there's only one way that can get met, and that's through a community. And if you become the brand that provides that source of happiness, your customers and clients will be hard pressed to leave you because you they they're getting that Jones, you know, that right. happiness Jones. Do you so have to build a platform for that? I mean, so like, could it be a, a Facebook community? Could it be a forum on your website? Could it be an event? I mean, what it just needs to be a place where they gather? It doesn't necessarily have to be online. I know plenty of fabulous communities that have no online component at all. I know um, communities that only are online. My personal preference is a, a combination of both because I feel like um, face-to-face connections are throwing kerosene on relationships. You can't, 
it cannot be imitated online. We can do this. You and I can converse on right. Skype. It's wonderful and great, and it ups our level of connection. But until we meet in person, there's always going to be that, that piece that's missing, right? right? Until I hug you, there's that piece <laughs> that's missing. Right. <laughs> so I like to see that. Anyway, so the three non-negotiables are um, connection, support, and then the last piece is predictability. We want to know how this community operates. What are the rules? Who's in charge? When do we meet? How do you get kicked out? <laughs> we want to know those things. Um, and that's the predictability that sort of anchors everything. Now, when these two circles overlap, the people who have the needs we talked about and that run into the community with the structure I just talked about, that's where community happens. Lots of brand communities get to this point and stay right there because it's really hard. Just to get all that done is <laughs> hard work. Just to keep those wheels turning is hard work. But the brands that really want to be heard above the noise, the brands that want that fierce loyalty, the Nikes, the Apples, the Harleys, um, go through one more growth phase. A certain number of people in your community, not everybody, but a certain number of people in your community will evolve if you give them the fuel for that evolution. Because the hallmarks of fierce loyalty, which is the final circle, um, in the model, are pride, trust, and passion. Okay. Community members feel pride. They are proud of being a customer of this brand. They wear the t-shirt. They've got the <laughs> bumper sticker. They have the coffee cup. They, you know, who they are. Um, they trust the brand, and they trust the other community members to have their back. Passion. They are passionate. They are in a passionate relationship with the brand. It is an integral part of how they define themselves. They can't separate themselves from it. So the brands that want that, that want fierce loyalty, focus on giving their community members opportunities and reasons to develop that pride, trust, and passion. And that's where your smaller group, but community nonetheless, of fiercely loyal community members move to. That's the model in a nutshell. How difficult is it? So sometimes I think people think if I have great customer service, I have raving fans. If I have a lot of Twitter followers or Facebook followers, then I have a community. But that's not really it. <laughs> That's why so many people focus on those numbers, and I'm like, I don't think the numbers uh, are quantity, such a big deal. Not quality, I know. Yeah. I'd rather have three fiercely loyal community members than 10,000 member followers that I don't know. I love that. How do you, let's say, if we're talking about a bigger brand, but we, a lot of our, uh, a lot of my community are smaller entrepreneurs. Maybe they're solopreneurs, or maybe they are simply, you know, have a, a team of five or less. Right. When it is important, how do you juggle that in? And what, when someone says, okay, well, what am I going to get out of it? What is the, the ROI of that? How am I going <laughs> to, how is that community going to help us? How, what, what is your position? That's the on first that? section of my book. Yeah. Um, because that's the, one of the first questions I get. Yeah. 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 I got 10,000 priorities. Why should I make this one of them? Um, and I'm going to tell you three. There are several, as you know, but I'm going to tell you three. Um, one is you get, a free marketing department. They will help you. I, again, I'm lazy. I need help. <laughs> I'm by myself. There's only one of me. I need a community to help me spread the word. Just like you were talking about with the iPhone 5. If you have a fiercely loyal community, they're out. And that is, you can't buy that kind of advertising. It is not for sale at any price. We've all watched brands try to buy it, and it doesn't work. So you have that. You have a free research and development department. Let's say you're trying, you're, you know, trying to come up with a new program or you're, you're toying with a new idea. You know, put it out there to your community and see what they do with it. They will, whenever I have done that, I've gotten fabulous feedback. And what they turn it into is always better than anything I could have come up with on my own. Yeah. And then the other thing is you have happy clients. And we all do our best work with happy clients, they are the 
They are the 20% that allow us to do our best work and that are the least trouble. Um, and we, that's what we want. We right. want to be doing work. Isn't that why we're in business? To make our clients happy and to do work with happy clients. Um, and all of that impacts bottom line at the end of the day. Right. I love that. Now, if someone wanted to go out, let's say they are a solo and they want to go out today and say, they are now saying, I am going to create a community. What takeaways or what could they go and do today to start that process? I mean, I know we talked about research and stuff like that, but. Before you do anything, the first question I ask every new client is, why do you want a community? What, what if they say, because I want more customers and more money? What do you say to that? Yeah, you all know what I say to that. I'm like, <laughs> um, I've read your book. <laughs> that's right. That's awesome, but it's not going to work because your community members or prospects will smell it a million miles away. Believe me, they've got lots of communities to choose from. You have to have a reason that's going to appeal to them. And if it's money and marketing and, make, you know, whatever, they'll know it and it, it won't work. It might work temporarily because we've all seen those flash in the pans. But at the end of it, then all the wheels come off and there's a crash. And we all go, oh, gee, look. Hmm, wonder how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> so figure out why you want a community. What will it allow you to do for your customers and clients that you couldn't do otherwise. The other thing that I've started asking is, or telling my clients to do, is figure out what you stand for. So many solopreneurs out there haven't really decided what they stand for, nor have they decided they don't stand for. Yeah, I love and that. you have to know both, and you can't waver. Ever <laughs> from those two things, <laughs> unless you, unless uh, the only option, the only um, exception to that is if you suddenly discover that you actually do stand for something that you hadn't thought you stood for before. That's happened to me. I think that's happened for, to every brand. But you've got to know what you stand for and what you don't stand for, because that's how you you give your prospective community members clarity about your community and and your brand. And you've got to know that stuff before you go out and start building a community. I've watched brands, they build communities prematurely, they haven't done the internal work, and their community's all over the place, and it's a mess. So do that first. <laughs> I love that. You know, if someone was going to go out, I, you you had to start somewhere, and I know you started out in the dorm, you know, trying to help the, the people in the dorm create a community. But let's say there was a woman out there, and she's thinking about, starting a business or she's thinking about doing something on her own. Can you think back to when you first started? What advice would you give that lady, not just around community, but of reaching out and starting something herself? First, I would say it's not for the faint of heart. And now I'm supposed to say, yeah, do it. But I need, you need to know it's not for the faint of heart. I did it because I couldn't do anything else. And I think that it has to be that kind of choice. It hasn't I mean, it's in that kind of commitment. It's got to be the only option available for you um, because it's too hard otherwise. Um, and it takes a lot of sweat equity. And you need to decide on the front end that you're willing to see it through because there will be days, believe me, you wonder why you thought this was a good idea. <laughs> there will be days when the people who love you will wonder why you thought this was a good idea. <laughs> That is a great point. <laughs> You've got to be able to see it through. So that's always my first piece of advice is really search yourself and make sure this is for you and that you're willing to make that long-term commitment um, come what may because it's really hard. just want people to not get all starry-eyed about what could be like. I agree. It's, it's tough. And, you know, I think online, especially, we see a lot of people say, do this and you can make a million dollars in three months. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, I agree. It just doesn't happen that way. I mean, you know, I've, I've well, built an be offline like business. Be like me. Take all my courses. Buy all my really expensive <laughs> stuff. And you'll be a gazillionaire. That's right. <laughs> it doesn't work. Anything that sounds too easy, it is. And it's yep. just not going to work. And that's the same way with what you've talked about with community. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be easy. 
if it was easy, everybody would have one. <laughs> That's a great point. We would all be Harley Davidson. That's just, That's right. yeah. We'd all be Nike. We'd all be Apple. We'd all be that. And, you know, it's, it's hard. It hard is hard. Work. Hey, listen, Sarah, if someone wanted to connect with you, and, and I will link up the book, and I will link up, uh, if it's okay with you, I'll put a, a, a diagram, the diagram on the website sure. as well so people can see that. Get the book if you haven't, guys. Anyone that's doing online business that has a, that in, or in a certain niche, whatever, you, it's important. I think it's important to, you're putting yourself out there, you're thinking of, of building a community. It's a great read, but I'll link all that up. But in general, if you wanted someone to hook up with you, where, where would you want to send them? Well, the place I live is Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, at Sarah Robinson is where I live at Twitter. Um, so there's that. <laughs> and it's the fastest way to get a response out of me. Um, you can also go to my website, which is www.fierce-loyalty.com. Those are the best two places um, to get me in the places where I respond most quickly. I love it. I love Twitter, too. It's my favorite. Oh, Twitter was invented for me. I'm just <laughs> glad other people. I'm glad other people get something out of it. I love Twitter. I do, too. I, I, do, I think I'm it's the best thing ever. My husband's best. like, are you still Twittering? What are you doing? Can you go to bed? <laughs> I love it. Sarah, I appreciate you taking the time. I love your model on fierce loyalty. I'm going to share it with the with the community. I'm calling it a community. I almost feel bad about calling my thing a community now because now I'm like I'm not there yet. But I have a mission to kind of to, to be better about it. Good. Good. That's all I can ask. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. You have a so terrific welcome. day. You too. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Successful Women Talk. Listen, a lot of people ask me, Sheila, how did you build a business from zero customers and revenue to thousands of customers and multi seven figures within a few short years? Here's the secret sauce. We had great products, excellent customer service, and we leveraged, this is key, we leveraged our systems and processes. If you want to learn more about this or how to reclaim your time, Join me over at www.successfulwomentalk.com and I'll show you how to get the life, business, and customers you want. Thanks so much.